Is it? Okay. Ah. Yeah, it's good. Thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank everyone who organized this conference, and of course, uh, rectors and high excellencies for coming uh, to participate in this event. Uh, this is, I should say that it's Indonesia is a unique place to me, and uh, this is my first time here, and I'm very impressed. I hope I will have another opportunities to come back to this um, remarkable place and this growing remarkable university. Um, as you already heard from, um, as you already heard from our previous speakers, uh, there are multiple connections between Muslim communities and Armenians, and this is, this have uh, Armenians have long been integral to the fabric of Islamic history, our presence spanning centuries and leaving an indelible mark on the socio-political landscape of the Islamic world. Through the preservation of history in manuscript and chronicles, Armenians have provided uh, with a unique lens to examine the dynamic interaction between these two uh, communities, offering perspectives and narratives that help us to piece together the complexities of history offer valuable insights uh, into Islamic political history, revealing the, uh, diplomatic relations uh, and sometimes conflicts that shape the region. Moreover, these uh, historical sources, they highlight cultural exchanges and intellectual contributors, uh, contributions as well, showcasting the transmission of knowledge and ideas between Armenians and Islamic communities. Religious interactions between Armenians and Islamic societies are also a crucial aspect of this history as seen in experience of Armenian Christians sometimes living under the Islamic rule uh, and ensuing religious dialogue. There are many historical chronicles. Um, Armenia has a written tradition from the fifth century so you can imagine the amount of written sources. Um, and after the rise of the Islam in the seventh century, Armenian historians started writing about Islam as well. Tens of them discuss different historical context of the Muslim history. But for today's presentation, uh, given the time limits and uh, the occasion, I've decided to focus uh, only on three of them. One of them is called Sebeos, uh, second one is Revond, and uh, Matthew of Edessa or Matevos Urhaetsi. Can you shift the... Uh, oh, thank you very much. So the first, uh, the first author, Sebeos, is from the 7th century, the second is from the 8th century, and the third one is from 12th century. I decided to focus on them to show the differences of, different, um, of the region in different situations. Um, one of the defining moments of Armenian history, if, if, if we may change the slide. Okay, thank you very much. One of the defining moments of Armenian history was the Arab conquest of Armenia in the seventh century. Armenian historians like Sebeos offer detailed description of the Arab invasion and its consequences, illuminating the complexities of Arab-Armenian uh, interaction uh, including agreements and social political changes. Sabeos penned this account in the seventh century, following the Arab conquest of the Middle East. It provides valuable uh, insight into early Islam and the social political landscape of the region. He records various events uh, happening before and um, uh, during his lifetime. Sabeus primarily focuses on detailing the conflict between Arabs and the Persians and Byzantines, with a special emphasis on their impact on Armenia. While the chronology may, uh, may, may be occasionally unclear, and certain, uh, certain events are interpreted through, through the 
religious lens, which was quite common in those uh, centuries, his narrative remains informative and gains significance due to its composition in the latter part of the seventh century. As it was uh, mentioned by Robert Hoyland, Sabos maintains generally objective and unbiased tone, which lends credibility to his account. Can we shift the slide? Thank you very much. Uh, Sabeo stands out as one of the earliest and most significant non-Islamic source regarding the early Islamic era. He penned account uh, about Prophet Muhammad approximately two decades after his death. On this slide, you will find a passage where Sabeo describes the Prophet Muhammad. This portray uh, portrayal assigned with early Islamic tradition in several ways. First, that prophet was a merchant, he preached monotheism, um, emphasized the worship of the God of Abraham and rejected false cults. He acted as a legislator, introducing new religious laws as well. So uh, you can see that Sabeos mentions five laws that Prophet Muhammad enacted for the descendants of, 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 of his people, including dietary restrictions, and prohibitions against lying and fornication, which correlate with early Islamic teaching as found in the Quran. For example, uh, you can see this in Surah Al-Nahl, verse 115. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Sabeo's text has garnered significant attention uh, in the realm of Islamic uh, studies with scholars delving into its insights. And here you can see uh, some of these um, uh, collections of uh, sources which also publish parts of Sabeos. Um, the second crucial source that I would like to talk about is the history of Revond. I'm sorry that I cannot go into very, very uh, deta details because of time limits. Of course, uh, we can uh, talk about these uh, chronicles, these histories uh, for, for hours, but today I will have some surface view. Um, and can we? Thank you very much. Uh, the second crucial source that I would like to talk about is the history of Revont, which has been recognized as a key source for the study of the early mod medieval Armenia. The Arab invasion of Palestine in Syria in the 30s of the 7th century and their rapid expansion, uh, expansion through Mesopotamia into Armenia a decade later are reported by the leading Armenian history, uh, historian of the 8th century. Revan's history of the Armenians present primarily the Arab domination of Armenia during the entire 8th century when Armenia was incorporated into the Viceroyalty under the Arabic uh, Khilafah and under the name Armenia consisting of three Caucasian uh, bordering countries, Armenia, Georgia and Caucasian Albania. Revant was an Armenian p uh, priest and historian who lived in the 8th century. Uh, of course, um, in, in many cases uh, I said that uh, these, we, we, we know very few about these uh, authors, so um, in many cases we have some informa information about them from their own texts. Uh, but there is no doubt that Revont emerged as a contemporary historian with his direct contact, his knowledge of the minute details portraying to geography, military conditions, and the consistent and complete list of 24 Arab governors of Armenia, beginning with Muhammad bin Marwan, with correct duration of their reign of each by years and months. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. The significance of Revon's history is not restricted to his uh, reflection of events and conditions in 7th and 8th century Armenia. In two important respects, the text imp impresses a much wider historical perspective one which looks beyond the experience of different regions of Armenia and the actions and fates of individual members of Armenian elite and contemplate the wider Near East. Firstly, it contains a complete sequence of khulafa, 
stipulating their years in office and offering short stu uh, studies of their personal uh, attitudes and usually their interaction with or impact upon Armenia. The characters of caliphs is described pi primarily um, in terms of their treatments um, and impact upon Armenia. It is striking that from the time of Abdul Malik, the interaction between caliphate and Armenia is not defined not only in terms of individual caliphs, but also in terms of their representatives. That is to say, in terms of individual commanders or governors appointed to position of authority across Armenia. There is a broad coincidence within the text between the accession of new caliph and the appointment of new representative over Armenia. Please change the slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Some of the characteristics of Gavon's history represent the author's contribution as a historian in matter of policies between the Arabs and Armenians, such as taxation policy, distribution of payments to the Armenian cavalry, the right of Armenian Naharars, nobles, and those of the landholding uh, aristocracy under world of oath in writing on the part of the Arab governor uh, of Armenia. So, for example, in uh, chapter four, Revont informs that Muavia, the first Umayyad caliph in Damascus, imposed tax on Armenia in the amount of 500 dahekan to be paid in one year. And here you can see a short paragraph from that part. <clears throat> Next slide. Thank you. Lastly, and in some ways most surprisingly, the composition in its present form contains a lengthy letter purportedly sent by the Byzantine emperor Leo III to the caliph Omar II responding to specific criticism and questions on Christian beliefs and practices posed in an earlier letter from the caliph. This section uh, of Revon's history has attracted a good deal of scholarly attention. Uh, and what is interesting that this letter can be uh, found in several Arabic language manuscripts as well and also in Latin language. So the letter presents by Revont serves as a vital source offering insights not only into the communi uh, communication among leaders, but also into the religious uh, debates between uh, Christians and Muslims during this time. Therefore, Revont texts hold significance in both sociopolitical and religious contexts. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said, I will talk about three main historians, and the third one is Matthew of Edessa or Matevos or Hayetzi. Um, his work, this historical source, is co uh, called Chronicles of Matthew of Edessa. This chronicle is a crucial source spanning from the mid 10th to the mid 12th century. As you can see, the demography, the political situation already changed in the region. It serves as a primary reference, not just for Armenian history, but also for Byzantine, Crusades, Syriac, and Islamic history, shedding light on previously unknown facts and documents. Scholars regard the chronicles of Matthew of Edessa as a key primary uh, source for understanding the Near East during the early Crusades. Um, we have limited information about Matthew of Edessa as well. Uh, during his uh, lifetime, Edessa, where Matthew resided, was predominantly Christian with Syrian and Armenians compi uh, comprising the populace. The city control shifted among Byzantine authorities, Turkish uh, sultans, agents, and semi-independent rulers until the arrival of the crusade in the late 11th century. Um, can you please? Thank you very much. Matthew composed his chronicle during the early 20th century, um, a very turbulent period in Near Eastern history. The once powerful Abbas uh, Abbasid Empire had largely fragmented with Arab and Turkish dynasties dividing and governing territories that were formerly part of unified Muslim world. The Seljuk Turks had firmly established themselves in Persia and Iraq, progressively 
encroaching upon Byzantine Anatolia. Meanwhile, the Latin West was increasingly interested in the Near East and had already secured control of a narrow scratch of land along the Eastern Mediterranean coast. Matthew's Chronicle deals with the interplay of these various forces. It opens with Byzantine emperor resurgence in the mid 10th century, goes to the describe the Seljuk advance in the 11th and ends with the arrival of the Latin Crusades in the late 11th and early 12th centuries. Matthew is generally consist, uh, consistent in his attitude toward the foreign people uh, with whom the Armenians were in contact during this period. He is very critical of those who considers to have worked against uh, Armenians, but he uh, praises all individuals, including Muslims, who acted benevolently toward the Christians. In the first half of the chronicle, the focus is mainly on Armenians and their interaction with Byzantium. However, in the latter part, Urhayetzi shifts his attention to those who exert greater influence over Armenia and Syria and Cilicia. First, the Muslims, then the Latin Crusades. When referring to Muslims, Urhayetzi primarily means the Seljuk Turks, who gained control over much of Anatolia in the late 11th century, overshadowing Byzantium and the region. The Turks play a central role in this history. Matthew's uh, perspectives uh, toward Muslim Arabs and Turks is distinctive. Uh, his views on Arabs and Turks are fair-minded. Interestingly, he tends to show more empathy toward Arabs. However, Matthew expresses admiration and gratitude toward several Turkish commanders and rulers as well. In the realm of medieval Eastern uh, Near East historiography, uh, Matthew occupies a singular position among his contemporaries. This is partly due to the strategic location of his hometown, Edessa, situated in convergence point of various peoples who have significantly influenced the region's history through uh, conquest or settlement. Uh, can you please? Thank you very much. In conclusion, the examination of Armenian historical sources and contrib as contributions to Islamic history unveils a rich history of interaction, exchanges, and influences that have shaped the complex socio-political and religious landscape of the Near East. From the detailed narrative of Sabeos, Revond, and Matthew of Edessa, and other Armenian historical sources, um, emerge a deeper understanding of dynamic relations between Armenians, Muslims, and other actors of the region. These chronicles not only provide valuable insight into specific event and historical context, but also offer broader perspective of religion, on religion, cultural, and political dynamics. Through their documentation of diplomatic relations, military conflicts, and religious dialogue, these sources serve as a window into the historic era, enriching our comprehension of the past. But I need to say that uh, the utilization of Armenian historical sources also present challenge, firstly, because of the language. So many scholars who are uh, studying Islam in, in the field of Islamic studies cannot read these sources because of the language. But fortunately, um, all three sources are uh, also translated in, into English. So if you are interested, you can, of course, read them. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I hope I keep my time limits. <laughs> and our first speaker, Dr. Naira Zakian, Beyond Borders, American Historical Sources as Contributors to Islamic History. Thank you. Uh, I would like to kindly request the audience to hold their questions because we will have uh, another speaker first. Uh, our own Professor Komarudin Hidayah will be the next speaker. Delivering uh, his speech, facing over, experiencing a religious community on others. Professor, time is yours. Thank you. Good day. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, my topic is passing over, experiencing the religion of others. This topic is actually 
doesn't touch directly to the essence and content what we are discussing today, but I try to put the framework to analyze the issue. That uh, now we live in such pluralistic society uh, that makes us uh, passing over to experience other religions more easy. And Indonesia, I think, is the best place among other countries that to have experience of other religion is uh, highly possible. And maybe my friend, like Bhagati, he is Hinduism. So this dialogue is quite uh, well, the right person to chair this meeting because you are Hinduism. And maybe to some extent, he has been a Muslim. He experienced at least the, the, the religion of others. And this uh, short paper, it is based on my experiences. Uh, the subject of faith and religion is human beings. It is uh, you, not human for religion, but religion for human being. So the subject is human, not the religion. Because humans are historical, social, and, creat and uh, creatures, social creatures, the experience and articulation of one's religion must be qualified with cultural influences. Well, even if I try to analyze many layers in my consciousness, some are coming from my local tradition, Javanese, some are from Arabic, some are maybe Western, and some are from Islamic. Therefore, my, my well, collective memory in my intellectual capacity, actually it is com composed from many uh, elements of different culture and religion. It is easy to experience other culture in terms of food and music. In the morning, we may have uh, breakfast, it is Indonesian breakfast, and we have lunch, maybe we have uh, Italian food, and evening in the dinner, we may eat maybe Armenian food. It is easy to have uh, experience of other in terms of food, and, and also in music. In music, we listen to so many various types of music. The question is, can it be easily implemented in the religious life? Gitu. Since uh, the subject of religion as human being, I'm sure, and it has been practiced by many people, we can experience other religious life. Therefore, dialogue like this is quite possible and enriching each other. Uh, so, in the idea of passing offer, we try to get the similarity, something unique, to enrich our own, uh, well, memories and richness of our cultural and religious experience instead of uh, finding the differences that make a conflict but we try to reconcile it by uh, well knighting many differences that it is good for us to enrich our uh, capacity in implementing and understanding religions Saint religious people are human beings religious belief and experiences are open to dialogue and discussion among religious people. And of course, it is uh, requires the, the, the well, open mind and uh, well, tolerant, inclusive, and it is practice, has been practiced in, in this university, that even though there are many students and lecturers coming from many different religion, it's good because it will be enriching each other. Why? Because uh, it is people that follow the religion. It is people that construct the understanding of religion. And it is the human being which is uh, well uh, practice the tenets of religions. Next slide. Huh? Next slide. Okay. Uh, next. Well, no, no. Uh, slide number again. Okay, well, this one. One says that religion is like a river. It originated from one source with the same central message. 
What's a belief in God? I think that all religion has this kind of doctrine. Even the, the, the not only formal religion. In Indonesia, when approach from the anthropological approach to religion, actually we have so many, many ten, uh, uh, maybe hundreds of religion. But when we follow the political decision imposed by the state, we only seek religion. You know, one among them is Kong Huchu. Kong Huchu basically is not religion. In the Chinese land, Kong Huchu is culture. But when it come grow in Indonesia, then it became religion. So to understand, to, uh, to identify religion, there are some theories. One may be based on anthropological understanding, categories, and another from political uh, understanding and, and categories. In the Quran, it is clearly stated that uh, al-Yahud, it is religion. Uh, that is, and they are the follower of Moses. But in Indonesia, it is not recognized formally by the state. Well, one belief in God, uh, even though the understanding of God is quite different, there are two types of God. God in her or his own self, beyond understanding, and second, that God we constructed in our mind. So, all the religious people, maybe they aware or not, they constructed the concept of God. But the absolute God actually beyond understanding. But we try to approach, to construct, to approach God through his uh, maybe creature, his name, and so on and so on. And second, belief in God enjoying to the good in this aspect that all religion, I think it's easy to cooperate because all religion also enjoy the good to good good. The third principle of religion that is belief in the soul's immortality. That thing that uh, make different between the secularism and uh, religion. That in religion there is a doctrine, a teaching, belief in the life after life. And uh, the consequence of this doctrine is that all religion has a doctrine about belief in the good and bad rewards of what is done during his life. Again, based on this principle that all the religious people can sit together, sharing together, and enrich together to each other because uh, they have similar and the same doctrine. If River, there are so many rivers, but if you ask the, the river, the water, they have the same objective. That is, they are going to the sea, to the large sea, even though they come up they, the first time from the same uh, resource, but at the end, they moving toward the same sea. Yet, this river seem there are so many rivers. That one theory that making a dialogue is possible among the religious people. Of course, in the religious studies, there are at least three type of uh, approach to different religions. One is exclusivism, the belief that it is only my religion that is uh, truth, so there is truth claim. The other is false. The other cannot offer the salvation only my religion that has a salvation. That's inclusivism. Second is inclusivism. They believe that their own religion is the best way, but still they include, they, they appreciate the others, to include the others. And the third is parallelism, saying that all religion actually just the same, parallelism. Uh, now I think that inclusivism is uh, growing larger and larger, but still some people, some group of uh, communities still having tightly the idea uh, of exclusivism. In Indonesia, I think that uh, the religious view is getting more inclusive because every day we interact with each other. And again, Gede, I think it's a good example, his Hinduism, 
but living here every day. He eat, he talk, he share with a Muslim friend. So uh, I don't know whether he still has uh, being a Hindu or Muslim. I don't know because it's very private business. Uh, well, and the encounter between teaching and followers of religion is getting more intense. Religion then has been transformed into culture that enriches human civilization. Uh, we believe that religions uh, reveal and come from God uh, brought by the prophet. But at the end of the day, when those religion practice implemented in the social life, in the daily life, then the construction of religion became a culture. Even though this culture, there are some elements from God, but at the end, it's become the uh, construction of culture. Uh, that's why that all people actually are children of culture, nurture and respect a culture. I'm a Muslim, but uh, my uh, behavior, my character, the way of thinking, my language, it is cultural entities. So religion and culture can be uh, well, uh, distinguished theoretically, but in practice, it is inseparable between culture and religion. Religion needs culture, and culture needs religion. But at the end, the manifestation of uh, religious behavior, they took place locus in the culture stage. Uh, religion is unique because it gives meaning and, and purpose to life. That the thing that's make different between what is science uh, and what is religion. Science, technology, ideology, and religion uh, are having uh, different element. That the uniqueness of religion lies in that religion give meaning and purpose to life, while science and technology provide technical facilities so that life is technically easier. Uh, some modern people, I think not some, modern society cannot live without technology and science, but they can live without religion. That's why that the role of science and technology getting stronger and stronger compared to religion. But anyhow, that science and technology cannot provide the meaning, the purpose of life, but they give technical facilities when the Oh, uh, the weather is hot, uh, there is uh, air conditioner. When it is cold, there is heater. When we want to go away, it's easy to be tired, then we use a uh, bicycle and so on and so on. We cannot fly, but we can use aeroplane and so on. This is the product of science and technology. So science and technology make the life more comfortable and, and easy to well, uh, technically and easier. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think what I have uh, said shortly give uh, insight that uh, it is uh, timely actually for Indonesian society, for modern society, and especially for this university, how to make plurality of religion became something that it is positive and constructive to contribute uh, to the civilization instead of uh, making plurality of religion became the source of conflict. And uh, the initially, all the religion try and give uh, the solution to have a life that is more uh, peaceful life origin this kind of, of idea. But at the end, if I listen to your well, presentation, that religious history is full of conflicts, full of tragedy, that religious uh, has a uh, well, bitter memory. I think we have to review again, to rethink how to make religion and the plurality of religion being more productive and constructive to contribute the, the, the better civilization of this world. Thank you very much. I have to end here. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I would like to kindly ask the audience to hold their questions for the Q&A later. Uh, for the next speaker, we will have uh, Dr. Haikachari from the University. Uh, Armenians as part of the medieval Nigeria. Вот
is this? It's mine? No. Yeah, it's not yours. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I will use that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me to say thanks for this, uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event, I will say it. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, I would uh, great, uh, first of all, the students and professors and ambassadors who are present here and say thanks uh, personally to Ambassador of Armenia, Mr. Serb Vejanian, for being uh, motiv uh, motivated and motivate us to do uh, such kind of cooperation, and for us it's very uh, unique experience. And I hope, as a, a Rector Hovansian said, is, this is the first step, but not the last, and it's the beginning. And we are thinking, it's already my thoughts to expand our cooperation by your assistance to the region. But we'll see what we we'll have at the end of the day. Today, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the Armenians in is and Islam. I named the topic, uh, previously it was about the Armenian co and Islam Muslim contacts in medieval time, but uh, last uh, yesterday uh, our meetings bring uh, me to the idea to some extend our presenta my presentation and do some changes. Uh, uh, I will f we'll focus on medieval time, but I will show you how our contacts and our uh, cooperation with Muslims and mainly with Arab society uh, go through the ages. Uh, let's start what we have. It's not working. It's, they said we can use this. Oh. Okay. It worked. As you can see, the idea, and you can uh, see from the 10th century's uh, sources, Ibn Hakkal, he says that it is known that they, Armenian Zimis, were Zimis, and they have had a, a different contract. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Islam divides the world in two parts, Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam. Uh, and uh, when the first contact came with Armenians, it was in, during the seventh century, the second, uh, second half of seventh century, and uh, uh, they, uh, uh, during that time, uh, the first contact was uh, this kind of razo. This they not to uh, extend the borders of Islam, which in Arabic terms they call futua. Uh, and uh, the first contact bring uh, the first idea of the between these two. Uh, nations and uh, Armenians as a Christians it was, it was recognized in the first contact with the Muslims they uh, used their rights as Islam uh, allowed to non uh, Muslims uh, as a uh, people of the book Ahl al Kitab they uh, have their rights to be to sign a contract to, to become the protected people. And the Armenians do that, uh, did that, and they become the, uh, uh, during this first contract, uh, contact the, okay. This uh, Ibn Hakkal's, uh, Hakkal's uh, map of 10th century, if you look precisely, you can find Armenia there. 
And the yellow one is the Isfahan, I guess. Next to yellow. But uh, first, the next. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this map shows the first uh, con uh, uh, first con way, the ways the uh, Arab army came to the. Uh, Armenia. You can uh, find here uh, the places, the main places where there were battles between Armenians and the Arab uh, 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 forces. But it, at the end, it uh, ends up with the conquest of uh, Armenia. Uh, uh, but at that time, Armenia uh, was not the independent state. There, there was the part of uh, some part was in Byzantium, the other part of Sassanid Iranian. Uh, empire uh, belongs, but uh, that whole region called Armenia. Uh, yes, this uh, and from that time begins the uh, this cooperation between Armenian and Mo uh, Muslims, uh, the, uh, as Islam allowed uh, to do. The, they signed the contracts. Uh, they, there are a lot of types of contracts, Art, you can see Art, Art, Sul, Amman. Uh, here, uh, two texts of the first uh, agreements from nine, uh, 652 and 654. Uh, you can see and you can read this first, uh, it's called Treaty of Moavia, the first one. Next slide. And not to go to read it, you can read and see the, the conditions that uh, Muslims provide for Armenians. The main, uh, the important thing here, you can see that they allow Armenians to keep 15,000 cavalry, which is unique for Ahl al -Zimma. You know, in Islam, Ahl al -Zimma don't allow to have a military, their own military. And uh, this is the unique uh, exp uh, time for and unique position of Armenia in the uh, frame of a newly established caliphate. The Armenians were allowed to keep their cavalry. This comes from real politics because they need, uh, Islam, uh, Islam caliphate needs them to resist somehow Byzantine forces. The second uh, treat is treat uh, Ibn Maslama. The next slide. It's, uh, here you can see uh, it's a translation from Al Balazuri. It's a widely known text. Uh, and uh, here again you can see the conditions where the Armenians were provided, which is also very unique. They not forced the Armenian to pay the tax. It was written that Armenians should pay the taxes, as uh, says, uh, says Quran, it was Jizya and Kharaj. But uh, in this agreement, you can see that allowed them to extend that payment, and we will find it necessary. And here, the caliphate gives the protection to Armenians to protect from Byzantian army, from Sasanian, uh, Iranian armies. It's a very important uh, place, but not go to the, the details of historical, this process of uh, where we have uh, cooperation, where we have the fight for independence from at that time. I would like to uh, stay on the idea of these treaties because Next slide. The, the idea of this treaty uh, comes from the so-called Madinas, Madinan Oath. You know, Prophet Muhammad uh, gave a, a contract to uh, Christians of Najran. And uh, that uh, model of uh, agreement became the sample for the other uh, type of odds uh, and other uh, 
other treaties which I was mentioned, uh, they are considered to be uh, inspired from the, this idea of first contact between Armenian and, uh, let's say, uh, Arme uh, Armenian Patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, who sign, in Armenian tradition we have that on the, on the, uh, that story about this uh, meeting between Armenian uh, uh, Gato, uh, Patriarch of Jerusalem. He headed the delegation uh, of Christians, Eastern Christian, to Medina, and by our, our Armenian tradition, uh, our Patriarch met with Muhammad, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, and he gave the first this oath protection, uh, some kind of aman to the Christians of Jerusalem. And the other, uh, and the treaty of uh, Muawiya, uh, treaty of uh, Habib ibn Maslama, they in our Armenian tradition, they considered to be re uh, re uh, a mistake there, confirmation. Uh, there should be a confirmation of uh, that uh, original lot. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, in Armenian, uh, next slide, we have this, uh, this uh, delegation, uh, the information about delegation is dated back to 630. The last day, uh, years of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Next slide. From this, uh, we have uh, the first already an, the text of the of this first contact. We don't have uh, publicly accessible, and we we, did, we couldn't find it. But in our patriarchate in Jerusalem, they have kept the copies of that uh, manuscript. But the other one, which is uh, uh, belong to Omar Ibn Khattab, uh, it's we have some kind of uh, copies of that uh, uh, ode. Um, there are some different interpretation of that ode. Uh, you can find text in Al Balazuri's uh, uh, Kitab Futul Buldan and the other places. In some uh, some places, you can find uh, the on the mentioned the old dominations where uh, should be uh, signed the, this uh, contract. I will choose for you. Uh, I I choose for you the one next slide. But it's not. You can if you can read. You can find in the middle the they mentioned the Armenians also. You can find. The second ode is, uh, next slide, is uh, go back to uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's known that, uh, and we keep some uh, later uh, copies of that ode from the 14th century, 16th century in our Matanadar and the place where our manuscripts kept in Armenia. And this ode, this ode, next slide, you can just see the previous uh, manuscripts were from that, copies of that. Next, sli next slide, please. Oh, it's there. Okay. Uh, it's a very long uh, manuscript. It's around 10, 10 pictures, let's say. It's one, it's about uh, one and a half meter Roll manuscript, which this one is copied around 14th century, and we kept in Martin Adaran. Next slide. And the if if there is some uh, problematic debates, 
in Arabic studies and Islamic studies about the origin and uh, authenticity of that, mono, that oath. There are no doubt that the, this one, the oath of Salah uh, is very famous and it's uh, unique because in, in that oath, Salah al-Din, when conquest the Jerusalem, the, he gave the protection to Armenians. And in his oath, he mentioned that he re re confer re confirmed the oaths that were given to Armenians from Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, from Omar, from Ali, and uh, some, somehow this uh, Saladin's uh, oath had, uh, proved the existence of the previous ones. Next, please. This is the Saladin's uh, oath to Armenians or, and to J Jerusalem Christians. Based on this uh, uh, chain of odds, uh, uh, of, of, to the uh, modern time or to the uh, late Middle Ages, uh, the, uh, during the Ottoman empires, uh, during the Ottoman empires, and during the Tanzimat period, reformation in Ottoman empires. Uh, Ottoman rulers uh, deal with Armenians based on this idea of that these people, Armenian, have their own uh, odds coming from the Muhammad, and they have the Amman, and they are Ahl al Zimma, and they can they should be protected. Next, you can see here the I, I mentioned Tanzimat uh, reforms, and the other one is uh, before that. Shah Abbas uh, period, pe pe period. Shah Abbas uh, from uh, Iranian Empire, he also deal, uh, deal with this contract, the idea of this common uh, oath which come from the Muhammad and give the Armenians protection, but he did it some other way. He took Armenians from their homeland and uh, 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 immigrate them to the Iranian part of uh, the empire, to the New, New Jufa, New Jufa, uh, Julfa. And the traders and the families of that New Julfa were the first who came to Indonesia and established the first contact. About that, uh, our friend Ararat will talk. OK, I will finish. This, uh, this uh, to give, because of this idea of odds, next slide, we, how we can keep this picture until now. This is the old Jerusalem. And as you can see, uh, it divided on four parts, Christian part, Muslim quarter, Jewish quarter, and Armenian quarter. We, can, we, we were able to keep this during the centuries, during the uh, Omar conquest, as you saw, during the uh, Salah Eddin conquest, during uh, Ottomans, during Crusades. Armenians were, the, were present in the Holy Land from fourth century. When we adopt Christianity as a religion, state religion, in the fourth century, the beginning fourth century, the first Armenian pilgrims came to and established presence in Holy Land. And we are there from that time. And the Sebeos was mentioned, the interesting, you can see it's very interesting part. If, we, when, if you go to Jerusalem, when you enter the old city from Jaffa Gate, you enter the Armenian quarter. If you want to go to pray to the wall, if you're a Jew, you should go through Armenian uh, quarter. In Armenia, we have a joke. That Zionism is about to govern the Jews around Zion, Mount Zion. But when Jews came to Zion, they found that the Armenians live there. Because Mount Zion is in Armenian quarter. 
and the grave of King David in the, uh, in the yard of our school. There. And the Tower of the David Tower, the Citadel of the Jerusalem is also Armenian part, in Armenian part. And it's a small part of Armenian presence in all city. If you go to Jerusalem around, you will find a lot of Armenian properties there. <sighs> Next slide. And uh, here I jumped to the 20th century and to the time where the, uh, all this ought were the idea of this protection was interrupted and happened the uh, Armenian genocide in Ottoman uh, uh, Turkey, in Ottoman Empire. This is the translation of uh, decree of King uh, Hussein al Hashimi, uh, Sharif al Mecca, who gave his de de uh, decree to protect Armenians. You can read to see how the forced the Arab uh, tribes and Arab uh, Ashurets to protect Armenians who are suffering from that and to help them to survive. And because of that, we have uh, a lot of survived Armenians' families, and now we have um, huge communities in the Middle East of Armenians. And we never forget this kind of this act of humanity from the Arab people and Arab uh, tribes. Next, I think I, uh, this uh, next one. Okay. In last slide, I think it's not working. You can see in that part. If you uh, we we did another. Uh, is it possible to open that? Uh, last slide with green. There are some hyperlink. Okay, uh, it's uh, I have, I'm running out from my time, but I just briefly uh, described the uh, the last uh, slide. I've tried to show the, our project we did in our department. It's uh, Muslim heritage or in Yerevan. It's a Google map, you can go there, and the old map uh, covered with the updated new one, and you can see the location of the old Muslim and Christians uh, religious places in, in the area of Yerevan, capital of, and you can click there and find the information about that uh, religious object, uh, in three languages, Arabic, English, and Armenian. It's, uh, I try to be more precise and more, did not go to the details. I hope you will have a lot of questions and, well, we have, and I will have chance to explore more about the situation. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Hi, hello, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, excellencies, especially distinguished guests from Armenia, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, and also students who are uh, coming to uh, this forum. First of all, I have been thinking very seriously to find what topics that I would like to present. Considering that I personally not an expert on interfaith studies as well as religious studies and also on the uh, studies of history. I'm a student of international relations. 
And <clears throat> as uh, Professor Komar also, Komarudin mentions that religion has also created some kind of problem in religions, even inside the religion. And there was also a problem in religions uh, among re the religions. And because of that, there has been a lot of cases of conflict, violence, war, and conquest, and so on and so forth with regard to uh, the religions. And uh, I, I, I'm thinking about what is the subject that might be uh, relevant to bring in this dialogues from my expertise uh, in this regard. I uh, decided to choose this topic in the civilizational dialogue for sustainable security in the era of originally globalized world, but I purposefully changed into in the era of uh, digital or AI revolutions. Well, I'm thinking that even though uh, it is said that technology uh, is technical and it is unlike ideology as well as religion, but I hope that it would be an aspect that provides us kind of common denominators. So people who come from different kind of backgrounds, different kind of religions, they might be able to work together and cooperate together. And that I choose that we discuss about digital revolutions or AI revolutions, artificial intelligence. Well, it might be contested, but, uh, well, it is a tool. Technology is a tool. And people, or most of us, if I may say, if I briefly uh, say it, well, most of us, when we have issues related to, related to our life as well as to our religion, mostly we will not go directly to our script, not opening the Quran or not opening the Bibles, but we go to uh, internet. We go to Google to us, you know, and then direct us to go to Quran or direct us to Bible or other scripts of religion. And currently, we are asking more uh, to the uh, new AI system, such as ChatGPT. you know, asking about something, and then they will give an answer, even though the answer might not always correct, you know. So, and here I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, bringing uh, these issues for uh, our uh, uh, discussion. Well, I said that this issue of the digital revolutions uh, might bring us into common denominators, as well as I bring also the issues of sustainable security. Well, the term of sustainable security is my own term. Uh, as far as many readings, uh, the term of sustainable security is not yet properly defined, and it is not yet properly studied. But I'm, I was thinking that we need to find a way on how different kind of civilizations, different kind of people are able to live in sustainable manner in their security. And I hope that through a kind of inter-civilizational dialogue, we will be able to promote trust, uh, promote confidence, so we will be able to promote security and uh, able to uh, confront uh, new challenges such as in the area of digital revolutions as well as an eye. Well, I uh, put uh, quotations here. The first is that, oh, it's a very famous one from uh, Samuel Huntington with saying that every civilization sees itself as the center of the world and writes its history as the central drama of human history. Well, Huntington is very famous for the class of civilization. There are a lot of critics about that concept, uh, but I do think that it is very useful for us as a warning as well as for prediction. Another one that I would like to bring here is, well, in 1950, uh, 1995, you know, there was uh, a famous term that being uh, said by uh, Joseph Nye. 
He said that security is like oxygen. You tend not to notice it until you lose it, you know? So this is how do we consider that this issue is also relevant for us to discuss when we are talking about uh, civil inter-civilizations or civilizational dialogue. And the last one is about the latest development. But it is actually a quotation from 2004 when uh, the uh, IT expert, his name is Ray Kurzweil, he was working for the IBM, he said that artificial intelligence will reach human level by around 2029. And follow that out further to say, uh, year 2045, we will have multiple, multiple intelligence, the human biological machine, in the human biological machine intelligence of our civilization a billion, a billion fold. So we are in a situation which is changing very fast. And our environment technologically grows very fast. And even with that situation, many governments, even the advanced countries, their they ability, their capability to respond in terms of regulation, they left behind, comparing to the uh, revolutions in this uh, digital uh, technology, especially on the AI. Well, of course, uh, I just would like to three, say three things basically here. The first is about the need for sustainable security, and the second one is on the role of uh, inter-civilizational dialogue and sustainable security, of course, and also how encountering the unprecedented uh, digital uh, revolutions. And then we will see uh, the next step of it. Can I help, please? Okay. Uh, well, the quotation that I said basically kind of cautionary message, the warning sign, and not it is about agree or disagree. And civilizations have been, of course, utilized and exploited uh, by many groups, many religions, many uh, states, and uh, different kind of organizations for their own interests. And of course, in our new brief world, uh, with the new landscape, with the rapid pace of technological advancement, uh, it will have impact to human life and also to our civilizations, uh, not only particular civilizations, but also for global civilizations. And I'm thinking that as an academic, we must think and we must contribute to address these formidable challenges and strive to transform into a better one, rather than we are merely occupying the role as armchair analysts. You know? So I'm thinking that our ideas should also have meaning to society and also uh, for uh, a change itself. Well, as we understood that civilizations, or with S, civilizations has uh, imprint to our uh, our world, to our well, any any our world, you know, our international system as well. Uh, civilizations play an important role in shaping how international relations and influence debate on cultural, to include cultural relativism, wars, identity conflict, uh, normative orders, soft powers and also some issues related to post-colonial perspective, globalization, and so on and so forth to include security studies. Our world is also characterized with globalization, and now we can see digitalization has profoundly impacted in the interconnectedness and integrations of civilizations. And, uh, well, I highlight on the importance of inter-civilization dialogue. You know. Human civilizations, history of progress, competition, war, and we also long peace, and also optimistic versus grim. The inter-civilization dialogue actually is very crucial to include also using the means of diplomacy if we use uh, in the interstate relations or international relations, the purpose is to create trust as well as confidence building. 
which lead to cooperation, and it is necessary. A different civilizations might have varying perspective in international law, human rights, the governance system, uh, influencing the debate also in a global governance on the balance of power and also in the anarchy of international society. Uh, in an II perspective, civilizations contribute to the sphere of security studies, of course within the IR theory, influencing discussion on security threats, alliance, and a conflict based on the civilizational identity. And in IR, uh, scholars examine on how civilizations perceive security challenges and uh, respond to them through, well, whether it is military, diplomatic, cultural strategies, and so on. The agenda for peace and uh, try to exp explore different kind of methods on how to develop different kind of strategies to address the risk of conflicts and wars that greeted by inter-civilizational class which has happened from time to time. Well, I then would like also to bring you to the attention on the importance of sustainable security. With that background, actually, different kind of state and international system itself promoting on how to develop security, but it's not security per se, but more sustainable security. In a study of international relations as well as in peace studies, we know the term of positive peace and negative peace. Uh, so a positive peace is a peace which is not only the absence of violence and conflict or war, such as uh, the uh, ceasefire that being achieved. But positive peace is the attitude, uh, structures, and institutions that require to create sustained peaceful solutions, or even the absence of fear. If we're using the term like the Quran, for example, they call it Alladi Atmahu Minju wa Amanahu Min Khauf. Amanahu Min Khauf is the absence of fear, and that's security. Sustainable security emphasizes the goal of achieving long term stability, resilience, and peace in an interconnected world. It is comprehensive, systemic, not only military, but also non military. And we can say it's something like the achievement of durable peace. So durable peace is very much similar to sustainable security. And by dialogue, but of course it is not only dialogue, because dialogue has to be mean also cooperation and collaboration in an inter-civilizational dialogue that contribute to conflict resolution and the prevention of inter-civilizational conflict and there hereby uh, promote more global security. Well, of course, within that landscape, we encounter to the digital revolution, which I do believe we can use it uh, as a means on how to increase cooperation, collaboration from different uh, nations, different countries, and different so society, no matter what are their differences. Well, we encountered with the technology as human scientific progress. So the, interestingly that technology is the product of human uh, progress. It is a knowledge production, which currently we enter the era of digital revolutions or AI, which is uh, characterized by the ubiquitous of digital technologies and AI system into various aspects of our life in the informatics, communications, economy, commerce, education, healthcare, governance, and so on and so forth. It is marked also by rapid of technological advancement, currently has already come to uh, our life, which is automation, fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, the combination between cyber, physical uh, systems, 
robotizations, augmentation, data-driven decision-making, and the transformation of societal structures and norms due to the pervasive influence of digital technologies and AI. So there is a cross-cultural communication in which AI technologies, such as natural language pro, uh, processing, you know, I mentioned before that we use like uh, ChatGPT and this kind of thing, enable cross-cultural communication by overcoming linguistic barriers and facilitating the exchange of the ideas and perspective, you know. Last week, there was uh, educational uh, exhibition and there are many universities from Russia that also come to that exhibition. And I met some of uh, many people from uh, that Russian uh, university and when I talked to them, interestingly, because their English is very limited, they speak using uh, this device. When I ask something, then he speak to the device and then he show me the device to show the answer. This is kind of communication with the new technologies that are able to bridge the barrier. Uh, even the language itself. Well, in that situation, I think this is the, uh, the next one is on the ethical, uh, ethical challenges. This is the area in which civilization, to include religions, they can work together, uh, or community of religions. I mean, like, there are challenges. The first is the data privacy, and we also have a problem of algorithmic bias, and there is ethical concerns that arise regarding the data privacy, and well, algorithmic bias, because uh, the algorithm is also based on the data that being feed uh, for the machine learn learning that they have. Of course, that kind of bias will contribute to perception and misperception, which is in IR is very classic, like that being uh, uh, written by uh, Robert Jervis about the perception and misperception in international politics. You know? And yes, there are many risks as well, the misuse of technologies, uh, and also surveillance, you know, uh, technology being used as surveillance and political control. So the rivalry among communities or between state, they can use uh, this technology for uh, surveillance and with rising concerns about ethical implication. Uh, we are now also, uh, this is the area that we can uh, pay attention, well, we are facing the massive spread of fake news, deep fake, massifications of propaganda, and so on and so forth. Well, now I would like to come to the uh, issues of final, uh, approaching our final issues about the imperative. How do we uh, uh, need to look forward? Well, I'm calling that we are entering into the new civilizations, which is AI, digital uh, system, the tools that could be used by human as a partner in, I call it human machine co-creation and co-production. And it is already uh, into our fact of life, no matter what differences of our religions and our civilization. So in that situation, since there is also the problem of ethics in developing AI, uh, the intercivilizational dialogue that focusing on the issues of ethical governance is important. Prioritize the development of ethical framework and governance mechanism to regulate the use of AI. Just an example, a Pope Francis from uh, the Rome uh, Catholic Church, they're very active in promoting the ethics of artificial intelligence. I think uh, other religious community should also work together uh, with other religious communities to uh, discuss and to explore on the issues of, of AI. The second is ensuring the transparency and accountability. While, of course, there should be equitable access to AI technologies across civilizations to prevent the di digital device. Uh, sorry, digital divides. Uh, cooperative engagement among civilization is very important. Share knowledge, collaborations, cultural exchanges is play a crucial role in promoting mutual understanding uh, and respect among civilization in this digital age. Well, of course, there is also need initiative to facilitate the cross-cultural learning uh, that bring us 
together. I'm proposing that in the case of Indonesia, Armenia, I think we should have kind of Armenia, Indonesia initiative. I call it A AII, you know, or A2I, for uh, intercivilizational dialogue and also to uh, promote cooperation in uh, promoting sustainable security as well as addressing together the trends or challenges in the new uh, era of uh, digital revolution as well as in the AI uh, technologies. And also uh, we need to work together to establish kind of ethical frameworks for the developments and deployments of digital technology and an AI is an essential and in intercivilizational dialogue. You know, just give you an illustration. Technology is, I'm not saying it is natural because technology is already value looted from the beginning. But development of technology, especially autonomous technologies, is also challenging the nature of human civilizations and principle of human independence, especially with the growing uh, technology in autonomous technology, such as autonomous lethal weapons, you know, because we should not give uh, the decision to kill human beings to the machines, or what is generally being called lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots. And uh, my two uh, last three points is we need to ensure digital inclusion and accessibility for all civilizations and also the important rules of wisdom in inter-civilizational dialogue to address future human challenges. And I'm sure that we also need to uh, encourage collaborative research and studies and innovation across civilizations. And I think uh, this kind of collaboration and in, uh, research or studies between the two countries, Indonesia and Armenia, would be very useful in the future. Uh, and Armenia position is also strategic, especially located in the center of Eurasia, uh, and uh, we, uh, Armenia can facilitate into the cooperation to the broader region in that area. I think that for me, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, as a triple IU uh, PhD candidate and as an Armenian, that's a very honorable event for me. It's a, even it's personal to have uh, my representatives of the Yerevan State University rector and my colleagues. It's an honor that I have been able to be a bridge between Triple IU and uh, my country, my embassy, and my uh, educational center. I believe that we not only have to study and produce, but we have to also have the ability to link people with other peoples uh, and engage in something that is positive. Uh, regarding my uh, presentation today, I didn't want to nearly present my uh, thesis topic, which is between uh, Christian, Muslim, peaceful coexistence. Uh, instead, I will rely on that, my last part, but instead I wanted to, as far as I'm not an historian, one reason and other reason that we have uh, scarcity in knowledge in providing from here in this short time any uh, historical uh, study about uh, Armenians in Indonesia. But whatever sources I have, the aim of my presentation is to not only historically and anthropologically to look at the issue, but rather to gain the message what has been positive in this 
existence of the Armenian community in Indonesia, based on that, to what we can rely that we can build our present and the future. Uh, I would like to this, uh, read this quote and after a little bit open up and make it more understandable. Uh, their affinity to trade was acknowledged by all sides as their commands to many languages. Uh, the Asians saw as being like uh, Europeans. Why is the Europeans considered them to be Asian? Rich with Christian values and being used to coexistence with Muslims. They had no, they had no imperialistic aims. They tended through family networks, did not pose a threat and as the Europeans with the large trading companies. If we open, if we try to open up these uh, brackets, as my colleagues previously, historically and in detail, presented the Armenian reality that is surrounded around Muslim uh, neighbors and in Muslim landscape, how they have been pragmatically integrated into living together in the region. As well, if we consider what is happening or happened in Indonesia at that time and Southeast Asia in general. Imagine Armenian communities, they were based on merchants' families, uh, entrepreneurs and businessmen, businessmen in our languages, that many of them, they came with their families and they uh, created the community based on the family numbers that they have. In this term, the community is not the, as the community that you know, the Christian community here, which uh, has been evident after the Dutch colonization, that is the difference with the Christianity that you have here. In comparison, the Armenians, uh, they've been able to create their community as the important two issues were to first create a church and second, to have a school next to the church that they can give the children Armenian knowledge and Armenian language. These two factors I want to stress here, even in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. The primary for the Armenian community has been establishing the church and the school at the same time next to each other. And uh, the two churches which I will talk later about that more in detail, both had a school and both had uh, libraries and elementary and secondary school. That Armenian language has been compulsory to be taught, even to foreigners that they also joined the school to be part of the Armenian school. The language has been Armenian compulsory for the foreigners as well, whether they were Christians or whether they were Muslims. Uh, in general, the Armenian immigration to Indonesia, uh, the record started, it has four stages. First stage from 1650 to 1750. Second, 1750 until 18,000. Third, from 19,000 until 1979, with officially the Armenian community has been dismantled because the Armenians, after the war, they've been affected very much from the economic and the war condition, and they moved mostly to Australia. But coming back to, to my uh, sources, I want to give you a clear understanding uh, how this all possible, the Armenian merchants, of course, you will give the question from where these Armenian merchants have uh, appeared in this region. Uh, I would give you, uh, I would recommend e this book to be, to be read by you if you want to know in details how the Armenian merchants had been created network that not only started from South Caucasus, but they've been on, uh, as well during the 16 and even 15 centuries has been created their own communities, merchant networks in Netherlands and in England. So in differentiation, you could ask that, uh, or you can uh, put in similarity with uh, the Dutch 
merchants or the, the companies that they arrived to colonize Southeast Asia, you should differ differ differentiate the Armenian factor here because the Armenian merchants were not uh, directed to the region by Dutch or Portuguese or even British. The Armenian merchants network has been created their own networks in Netherlands and in England that time, which was not under the control of Dutch. They had created their grass root of grass ground uh, network that belonged to the Armenians itself. Where these Armenians come originally, that they have created this network, they come from Julfa, uh, Isfahan, which is part in Iran. And uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, the map you can see here more clearly to have a uh, little bit more understanding how they move from, in this map, from uh, eastern part, which is Iran, and they move to, uh, East India uh, Sea and the Indian Ocean, and they had established their communities mainly in the cities that they had ports. For example, in Malaysia, in Mal Malacca Straits, and in uh, in uh, Indonesia. In uh, first, in uh, the community was in Jakarta, and later it moved to Surabaya. I will explain further. This map should not only give you. Uh, an, an expression as it is only a trade route map, this map has also an implication social and political as well. Uh, I will show you some examples of, uh, next slide please, uh, of some postcards, uh, which gives you very interesting understanding if you try to read uh, the letters written on the postcard and messages in how many languages and in how many countries stamps. For example, here the first uh, postcard letter sent from Julfa, from Persia, by Armenian merchants to that reached to Indonesia. Uh, and if you see the letters, there are Armenian letters, there are Dutch letters, English letters, even Russian stamps, and even uh, Persian uh, letters. So this gives you the un whole understanding. And uh, on the right side, there is also an Armenian, in Armenian letter, uh, alphabet letter, which is written to uh, one of the cousins of the families. This is not related about business. This is a personal letter to, written from Persia until Indonesia to a family member. So this as I mentioned, it has also its political, social, cultural impact. Only by looking to these some uh, postcards and stamps, we can see that how it can be a multicultural reality on post postcards. This is not simply a postcard. That was my message that I, want, I took from this and I wanted to present it to you as well. Uh, this is a, mag uh, a journal that belongs to the Echmiadzin, uh, which I wanted to stress on this uh, because it's very uh, valuable information has been written here. Uh, in 1961, a priest from Australia comes to Indonesia to uh, see how is the condition of the community because as I have mentioned in those years the community was affected very badly during uh, due to the wars and due to the especially the Japanese invasion. The Japanese invasion also attacked Armenian properties and many Armenians were being taken to concentration camps and uh, they've been killed in the concentration camps. So very little community members have been here and they wanted to know what is the fate of the Armenian community in Indonesia will be in 60s. For that reason, the priest from uh, Australia has been called by the Armenian uh, committee, church committee to visit and see what their properties and churches, the fate of the properties and churches will be. But it's very valuable that after he returns, he writes an article of his impressions about Indonesia. 
That is, in my terms, it's, the value is not that he's providing information about the church and the Armenian community and uh, how, how valuable has been the social and cultural life in Surabaya per se, but the message for me was very valuable that he was writing about his impression about his visit to Indonesia. First, uh, he has written that Indonesia is one of the most beautiful countries he has seen. Second important, and he's describing very nicely all the voyages that he's been from Java uh, to West Java to East Java to even Bali. And his impression first on Archipelago when he says it's surrounded, uh, the country is, he's not mentioning Archipelago, but he's mentioning it's surrounded by sea and timeless, uh, timeless uh, sun. So this is, was his first impression of uh, Indonesia. And second, he's talking also about the politeness of the local people to the Armenian community. This is also very important because we know, and I've been acquainted also about the politeness of Indonesian that we call it already the smiling nation. But for visiting priests that he doesn't know the country and having impression of the politeness and civility of the Indonesian people towards the Armenian community, there is something political positively that we have to talk about this because we know very well from the writings of the Dutch and some English uh, anthropologists and that time when they came historians, I've read myself that many times their impression was the local people were not civilized and they came, to, they came here to civilize the people. But what we have seen now, the Armenian priest is coming here and he's writing an article and showing, writing that the civilized and polite people, what he saw in Indonesia, it surprised him how he treated the Armenian uh, community and how the community was together very much in uh, cooperation. I want to jump to another source, which is a Dutch source, which talking about the Armenian involvement in Indonesia, about the Armenian community. They have uh, mentioned the Armenian community as very religious, but at the same time politically conservative. So this is the Dutch evaluation of the Armenian community in Indonesia. So I wanted to do some uh, comparisons uh, regarding the impression of uh, Indonesians and Armenian priests and the Dutch regarding the Armenian community. Next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, this is one of the famous, very families, the Sarkis that we have talked about, uh, that they have the, they have, they had the creating, not monopoly, but the ability to create first hotels in not only Indonesia, but in all Southeast Asia. They have been the first uh, who, family brothers together who created the hotel industry in Southeast Asia. They had uh, one all hotels raffles in Singapore, another hotel in Malaysia, another hotel in Surabaya. I will talk about this later on. But I wanted to bring here also uh, Margaret Sarkisian's uh, article, which uh, talking in detail about first the enrollment of the Armenians in Southeast Asia. And as I mentioned, I quoted from her, uh, her article what I presented in the beginning in my, in my presentation, which I believe is very, important to know also that the merchants in comparison to Dutch were also independent network and in that terms we should differentiate the Armenian companies, the Armenian factories, for example they had sugar factories, Sarkis families, they also, they didn't only construct the hotel industry, they also had with their other Armenian colleagues like Artum family, they had constructed, and Manuk family together, they had constructions in uh, sugar factories here, and many also buildings that belonged uh, to the government. It's not only that they have established their own 
uh, business, their own businesses, but at the same time they also constructed uh, buildings that uh, belong to the Indonesian government. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, these are the two churches. I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, churches. Uh, this is the church, uh, Surpovanes Church, uh, St. Uh, John's Church, which is in Jakarta first. Uh, on the left, it was in Jakarta. And I would like also mention that next to it, it has been also an Armenian school, as I have mentioned before to you. This uh, church has been established in 1855, uh, middle of 19th century. And next to it, it has also uh, Armenian school, which has opened after three years. Uh, from the establishment of the church. Plus, in Jakarta, the Armenians in the same area, they have established also an Armenian community uh, that uh, can arrange the affairs of the church and the school. The location, I want to talk about also the location, which is very important, not in terms of being any uh, uh, institution in a location, but at the same time, it's very important that that time, Indonesia has provided Armenia to have church in one of the best place in the city in Batavia, which is uh, Madina Merdaka. This is in Merdaka Street, which before also it has been very important street in Batavia. Uh, so after after the independence. After the independence, the Indonesian government decided to create, uh, after the independence, to, to, to renovate the area and create an independence uh, platform. For that reason, this church, it must be abolished. But after, this is also very important nuance I want to mention that there was negotiations between the Armenian community, Armenian committee, which I have told you it has been established, and the government of Indonesia. That time, uh, the head of the church and the Armenian committee has uh, had a meeting with vice president of Indonesia, and vice president of Indonesia explained that this, be, this church must be removed, not against Armenian community and not against religion, but the area must be created an independence uh, independence uh, area after the after the country independent. So the Merdaka will be a place dedicated to the independence and Indonesia. That's why they had to remove. But he mentions the vice president mentions about Armenian as loyal citizens, which. This, we cannot call it citizen because they were not Indonesians in uh, citizenship, but he wanted to mention that the Armenian community has been a polite community as well, and he mentioned that Armenian community has been very trustworthy and loyal. For that reason, the Indonesian government promised to give Armenians another land for free and in also good location in uh, in uh, Jakarta. So this is also very important nuance because we know in Indonesia, after I, the field works I've done many uh, times, I've realized uh, having worshiping places, reestablishing new f uh, worshiping places is somehow in some places uh, there is a problematic, for example, in Bekasi or elsewhere, but in Kampung Sawa that I'm doing the research, it's very famous area for having uh, Christian Muslims worshiping houses next to each other historically. But the importance when we look at the Armenian community, which their number was not very big, not exceeded 600, attention very seriously given from the Indonesian community, uh, Indonesian government, sorry, to the Armenian community. And the prestige that Armenian community has been labeled as loyal people, this is very important political message that today I think we can establish our relation, not in terms of politics, uh, but in people-to-people -people relation. When the government asks 
the church must be removed from this area, but the government giving the Armenian community promising land for free, and it was established another church on that land, which was not, which was, which was not very far from uh, the center as well. Uh, and the next uh, church, which uh, we have been not, uh, uh, back, back please, back slide. The next church is the new photo that I have been able to find is, the, is uh, the church that today belongs to the Chinese church. The Armenian after 70s when they left, they sold the church to the Chinese. Uh, the name of the church is St. George. This church has been built in beginning and mid of 90s. As I have mentioned you before, the Armenian community, when the Surabaya port started to be considered in the uh, new Silk Road, area, Surabaya port became more prominent, and Armenians also, some of them moved, some of them stayed in Jakarta, but the Armenian cultural, social, educational, financial center became turned to Surabaya. So another church and another school has been built in Surabaya in 1927. Also about this church and the school, I want to make another important uh, fact that we can also rely on today in developing or redeveloping our relations. The life in Surabaya, the Armenian community has, although it was started and developed by the wealth of the merchants, but new generations started to create cultural and social values. I will give you two remarkable examples. One, the Armenian college that they've been established in Surabaya, that is the first European style uh, college for elementary and secondary. Even the Dutch that time didn't have school, so the Dutch, they sent their kids to learn in Armenian school. So we can conclude that in Indonesia, the, the international school, as we, as we call it today in our languages, the first international school has been opened by Armenian family, not the Dutch or British or the Portuguese. And another important issue that Armenians also started to come from other areas, for example, when I mentioned that Armenians came originally to this region from Persia, but they were from India moving to this region, the merchants, but also uh, many young sportsmen started to come to Surabaya and by the Armenians' invitation, and they have created an Armenian sport club which was the second Armenian sport club in Indonesia before it was the British club. For football especially, it started. So this, uh, the, the source gives very interesting information that after this first football match in Indonesia between British and Armenian groups, football became very famous in Indonesia. So we have maybe part also in making football famous in Indonesia after that match. So, uh, and also they established Armenian, food, Armenian sport club, which had not only football, had cricket, basket, golf, and in international Olympic championships, which were held in Indonesia, most of 80% who had the gold medals, they were the Armenian sport club players. This is also, for me, this was very, a new information, I knew about the church, I knew about the community, I, we knew about the merchants, but knowing that first Armenian school and especially first Armenian club for sports is created in Indonesia by Armenia, this is also for me was fascinating information. Next slide, please. This hotel uh, that we have talked about is just for information because this hotel also has an historical aspect as well. It hasn't been only just hotel. It's opened by Sarkis family in Surabaya. First, it's called uh, Orange Hotel, which also had very important location in the city center. But after the Dutch invasion, the Dutch uh, ruined the, the, the hotel and they transformed it into, into a military base. And after that, the hotel came under Japanese control fully. It was demolished. But after that, we see the new hotel that stands today. 
uh, next slide, please. The hotel currently is called Hotel Majapahit, and this is the, uh, the condition, new condition of the hotel. Concluding my, uh, next slide, please. Concluding my uh, presentation, I want to uh, show you also a picture of Sarki's family brothers, with the, which they established all the hotels that were being in each country the first hotel. For example, here is mentioned Ruffers Hotel in Singapore, E and O Hotel in Penang, and the others also. But here, here is the hotel of uh, Indonesia in Surabaya. It's not mentioned in this photo. Concluding my uh, presentation, I wanted to mention that what message we have learned from all this is not only historical facts that there have been some churches and uh, there has been Armenian community here, but as I have mentioned, we can, we can reach to an argument that quality is better than quantity in many times because it's a very interesting question, how come 600 people, individuals in big Indonesia can create such positive attitude in Indonesia that the government was keen to keep the Armenian church by giving them another land. So as well, how Armenians in this different ethnically, religiously, and in landscape manner different, they have been able to create not only their religious and educational centers, but also they have been able to create sport clubs and join in the real life of Indonesian sport landscape and, give, and take gold medals. So it means that if we live in an area, harmony is not enough, social coexistence alone is not, tolerance is not enough. We have together to participate in active on the ground actions that brings new identity in terms of culture and sports. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, my name is Saima Shamim and I'm from Nepal. Um, today's talk was really interesting. So basically I have a lot of questions, but I will just end up with two questions if you allow me. So um, regarding the paradox that was said by Professor um, uh, Kamaruddin, he said that religion is like a river originated from one source with the same central message. Um, how do you address the diverse interpretations and practices within Islam and Christianity, especially within Christianity, uh, sorry, um, especially within Indonesia and Armenian context? And my second question is considering the complex history of colonialism and imperialism in both regions, how have external influences shaped the interfaith dynamics between Islam and Christianity, and how do these legacies continue to resonate today? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Would you be so kind to repeat your first question? Yeah. Um, as he said that religion is like a river originated from one source with the same central message. So how do you address the diverse interpretations and practices within Islam and Christianity, especially within Indonesian and, uh, and Armenian context? Diverse inter... Yeah. Okay. I think... Um, okay. The second question...
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, extended to the communion of churches in Indonesia. I'm Rosie, representing the PGI. Uh, same with the previous question. I would like to make some remarks based on what Professor Komarudin uh, presentation just now. The first one, yeah, I do agree that human and cultural influences are two things that inseparable. But then my question is, is the basic principle enough for us, people of different faith, faiths and religions to sit together? Because I feel like uh, based on our experiences as churches in Indonesia, it's not enough. We need something more. We need something, uh, something that really unites us. Something like humanity maybe, something like uh, compassion maybe, something like that. And since we are scholars here, I, can, I would like to say that we are a group of scholars here. Um, there is more on scholars can do, can contribute to extend the research and the development of living together. Because <clears throat> as uh, the last speaker, uh, Ararat, Ararat mentioned, harmony alone, harmony alone is not enough. So there should be something more, something big, something that is tangible, that can make us sit together and work together. That's the first one. So it's just a remark, but if a professor has uh, his further explanation, then it would be very meaningful for us. Perhaps we can take only one question. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, then the... Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then the third... Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address uh, the challenges to uh, interfaith dialogue and cooperation. Would you be so kind to introduce yourself? Oh, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm Nadia from Faculty of Education. I would like to address some challenges to uh, interfaith dialogue and cooperation uh, between uh, Islam and Christianity. I believe uh, opposition can come uh, from both sides, from Muslims and Christians, uh, because in one occasion, a Christian who brought the idea of a Muslim and Christian alliance was accused of embracing Chrislam. Chrislam, Chrislam. So, yeah. so this term uh, was first coined uh, by uh, English novelist in 1913. And also again, it is mentioned in uh, Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke's novel, uh, The Hammer of God in uh, 1993. Uh, to me, Chrislam means uh, Muslim and Christians uh, cannot love, respect, and cooperate with each other. Uh, so there should be some kind of hybrid religion. So my question is, what can we do? What can we do to counter uh, the propaganda opposing uh, Muslim and Christian brotherhood? Thank you. Um, do you pose the question to a particular speaker? Or? Uh, to all speakers. Oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. I think that's the first uh, three uh, Uh, 
by saying that I would like to say that religion needs a culture by which then the message can be communicated to the people. And second, that uh, all people, all society, influence and shape their mind, their habit by the local culture. That is why our religion influence and qualify with the uh, local culture. Uh, after years and years, and then God sent again, resent again the prophet to improve, to add, to make a complete religion, and at the end of religion, according to Muslim, that Muhammad is the last prophet. So, according to Islam, actually, from Adam to Muhammad, actually, bringing the same message, belief to God, belief to life, to life, to do good, and so on and so on, but they have differences in, in uh, ritual, in some regulation, because the people they meet is different. Uh, and those construct of religion also influence by the, the people, that is why, just like river, although actually first time this one, but then became many branches of a river of religion. And those kind of uh, various religion, basically if the branches to the asset of religion, actually will find the same message from God. But in terms of culture and humanity, there is many local culture, there is local uh, uh, nuance from, from culture and branches, that's become uh, diverse. Then how should we, well, uh, uh, three other religious differences? Well, if we can make differences or within the level of uh, humanity and social ethic and uh, other, other, well, human experience, we can sit together, we can share, we can have common ground, on which we can have a dialogue, conversation, and enrich other. That's what I mean by passing over. Passing over in terms of uh, uh, humanity and cultural aspect, not at the level of very uh, private experiences. Just imagine like sport. You have so many games, Asian games, for example. There are many type of games that they have similarity that make under the category that it is game. But game always games, it is plural. The same is true for religion. Religion always refer to religions. There are so many religions, but at the same time, each religion has its own uniqueness. That's why all religion, because it own uniqueness, when we go to the church, to the temple, to the synagogue, they practice, they manifest, they implement their unique belief, but when they go out from the church, from the mosque, we meet together, we share together at the level of humanity and culture. Uh, like in this university, we have different people coming from different religions, but because we meet at the level of ground, uh, what is, that is to share knowledge, to extend culture, we can go, we can uh, have uh, many common agenda. And Indonesia, I think, by having Bini Katunggal Ika, that the plurality and religiosity, it is the DNA of Indonesian society. That's why all the uh, next leader in Indonesia, and for Indonesia, they should understand and they should appreciate this DNA, that is plurality and religiosity. And now the world's getting more plural and also still religious, still religious. If, even though many thinkers, many philosophers try and predict that religion will finish, will put aside, but still we know what we are witnessing, that religion is still growing and growing and growing. So plurality and religiosity not only growing and exist in Indonesia, but it is also in the world. And that level that is based on humanity interest, on human interest and cultural agenda, we can share, we can see together.
page that was I'm doing in, in my thesis. First, second comes the feeling of coexistence. But what is not enough? The third stage, I believe we have to do together, uh, create a reality that on uh, actively we can create together a value. It doesn't matter if it's sport, it doesn't matter if it's education, it doesn't matter if it's in politics. There have been many examples in the Middle East, for example, that the Armenians, Armenian community has been also uh, active part in Arab nationalism. And Arabs also, they have been uh, defended also of the Armenian nationalism. So that is the reality. Maybe uh, the fact has created these two nations to live together not only peacefully, but to be active also in creating values mutually together, that they can uh, be not only one day tolerant or if situation continue, uh, changes to be next day intolerance or not uh, to be in peaceful coexistence. But when you create together a value, as I have mentioned in sport, when Armenian club created a sport club and many locals and foreigners joined there, that is already a value. So we have to be more active on the ground to create something that joins both of us in the reality. Thank you very much. Second batch of uh, questions. I would like to invite again, and then yes. Second one. Maybe one more from the audience. We have two or three. Okay, let's just um, start with the first question.
when uh, we have Islamic sources or other sources creative and contrast between Armenian Christianity and Islam, Islamic communities, especially during the uh, you know uh, Umayyad and Abbasid period. Of course, we have a lot of evidence as uh, our ancient uh, merchants in the early Orient period. But I think in the early Islam and the Abbasid period, we need uh, to learn more. Not only conflict, but also you know the notion of creative uh, encounters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Perhaps we will uh, give the time to our Armenian uh, counterpart to respond. Thank you very much for uh, these uh, thoughtful questions. Um, I would like to um, say a couple of words about tolerance and harmony that you mentioned. Christians uh, had a huge part of uh, that uh, movement. We know that 
discussing also if this need to be implemented in the level of cultural affairs and in the interest. Just imagine when we come to the mall, for example, or the common place, we never think about, uh, we never ask what is your religion. No, but we have the same, uh, maybe uh, same interest, common background, we share the differences while uh, having maybe coffee and lunch together and so on and so on. Okay. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our agenda. Once again, our sincere.